This episode of History Saver is brought to you by Addressing Gettysburg. Addressing Gettysburg is a podcast that shares great experiences, quality programs, awesome guests, and is a welcoming community for all who love Gettysburg. So join in with host Matt Callery and find out why Addressing Gettysburg is one of the top rated podcasts online today. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, Podbean, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, and on Instagram, Facebook, and of course, right here on YouTube. So check out Addressing Gettysburg today, where history is not boring. Thank you to Addressing Gettysburg for sponsoring this video. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Cornerth, Mississippi. Now, in this episode, I'm not going to be able to hit on the battles and sieges of Cornerth that takes place after Shiloh. But in order to understand the Battle of Shiloh, you first have to understand the very spot I'm standing in right now. This very spot is one of the most vital, most important pieces of the entire Confederate Army in 1862. Without the railroad you see behind me, and this intersection, goods, arms, food, etc., 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 can't go to the Confederate Army. And that is the reason why the Confederate Army wants to protect Corner, and that's the reason why the Union Army wants Corner, is because this very intersection right behind me. now we are in Tennessee and we are at another Civil War battlefield that I've wanted to see my entire life another one knocked off of the bucket list notch of battlefields here we are in shallow Tennessee along the banks of the Tennessee River and to be precise we're in Pittsburgh landing now during the American Civil War this was primarily one of the first bloodiest battles of the war. The Battle of Shiloh kind of come as a shock to the nation. So there's a lot of reasons why the Battle of Shiloh really kicks off and why it takes place here in this location. But the primary reason is going to be at Corinth, Mississippi, just down the road from us across the Tennessee Mississippi state line. Now, why is Corinth, Mississippi important? Well, it's a crossroads of railroads that are going to run not just south to the Mobile um, and Ohio Railroad, but also the railroad there is going to run to the East Coast. So it's a vital railroad for the Confederate Army and the Union knows if they can control that railroad, then they could control 
and cut off the head of the snake of the confederacy and all of your supply lines so with all of that being said which is a mouthful all of that's going to lead us to right here where i'm standing now along the pittsburgh landing in the winter of 1862 and well there was never supposed to be a battle to occur here in this location but it does and we'll talk a little bit about why that happens as this video progresses forward but i want to show you shallow and the battlefield here from my perspective as i explore it and i'm gonna take you along with me so let's go explore shallow battlefield right here along the banks of the tennessee river so we're going to talk about first of all pittsburgh landing where we are right now to kick this episode off as we continue this history across america tour this is another big place i've wanted to see particularly this area and we're going to throw up some photos here these are photos that were taken somewhere in this vicinity in 1862 those are the union gun uh the union transport ships that transported union soldiers here and they are going to land right here along pittsburgh landing there's a lot that's going to bring them here u.s granted at, at the time isn't as big as what he is that we know of now. Grant does not have a good reputation. Ulysses S. Grant is a uh, thought of as a drunkard. Um, there's a lot of people that don't like him, including Halleck. So Halleck doesn't really care for Grant, but Ulysses S. Grant is taken out of position. At, he is, at this time, he's a hero to the Union. He's taken two fortifications in uh, Tennessee across the river here, and he, he's thought of as a hero. Well, Grant is going to be upstream, which is, or excuse me, downstream, uh, which is going north in this direction at another town really close by at a place called uh, Cherry Mansion, Cherry uh, Plantation, something of that nature. So he's going to be there. And he is put back into command of forces. There's going to be some gunboats that's going to come down this river, and they are searching out the confederate positions that said to be putting artillery emplacements on the hill right here at pittsburgh landing well they knocked those out the confederate the confederates abandoned that and what ends up happening is the union forces start landing all along the river including right here at pittsburgh landing they throw up a camp here and this is going to become a base of operations for the union army this is a major 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 important spot because it's along a major waterway. And this is where we're going to start this whole shallow ordeal, or as the Union called it, the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing. So here is Pittsburgh Landing. This is where the Union forces are going to land, and they're going to set up camp in this area. And then that's going to take us into the events that transpire on April the 6th and 7th, right here in Shiloh. Let's go. Okay, so where we are right now on the battlefield is the Soldiers National Cemetery here in Shiloh. Now, this cemetery was established around 1866, a year after the war. Now, there's only three or four non Confederate soldiers buried in the cemetery. We don't know who they are. We don't know why they're in the cemetery, but they are. And the reason for that is, well, they will only bury Union soldiers in national cemeteries. And this is a cemetery that is set aside for the Union soldiers, most of who died here in action during the Battle of Shiloh. And a lot of these soldiers are unknowns. Some of them are known, but a lot are unknowns because they were interred later after the uh, date of their death. They were buried on the battlefield in burial trenches a lot of times, and then they were reinterred here uh, later on, starting in around 1866. Now, in this general vicinity as well, there's a couple of cross cannons. I don't know if you can really see it through the trees here. Um, I don't know if you can really see it through the trees here behind me, but those cross cannons is where it is said that General Grant is going to be on April the 6th at the end of the day in his headquarters camp here in Shiloh. 
Now he's awoken at night and he's instructed, hey, General, you may want to get out of here. Grant says, well, we're still going to be here tomorrow. Um, there's surely the devil to pay, but it's going to, it's going to be a fight. So Grant is going to be somewhere in his vicinity. And well, also during the battle, you got to think this cemetery wasn't here. This was a very high bluff here on the Pittsburgh landing area. This is going to be that Confederate artillery platform where Confederates are attempting to put in artillery that the Union um, is going to try to stop. And then they're going to land right below me at Pittsburgh Landing. And it's somewhere in this general vicinity uh, from where those original photographs that we have of the Pittsburgh Landing are going to be taken. Uh, I don't know really exactly know where, okay? Um, but it is somewhere in this general vicinity where those photos are actually going to be taken. So it is just fitting to start off here in Shiloh with showing you this cemetery. And as we go through the battlefield, um, we will see some of the burial trenches or where they used to be. The Confederates are still, a lot of them are still buried on the field in burial trenches. Some of them have been reinterred somewhere else, but there's still burial trenches on the battlefield. And we probably will see some of those as we go through the battlefield on this episode. So if you come to Shallow, well, this is a beautiful cemetery and this really speaks to the meaning of what you're seeing here and is a fitting place for us to start our journey of the Battle of Shiloh. So this is supposedly the headquarters position of U.S. Grant the night of April the 6th, 1862. General Grant in his memoirs said that during the night, rain fell in torrents and our troops were exposed without shelter. I made my headquarters up under a tree a few hundred yards back from the riverbank. The large oak tree referred to standing where this marker now stands was destroyed by a cyclone in 1909. So this is apparently where Grant is going to have his headquarters. And this is going to be probably not a good night's sleep for Grant as, well, in the days before and on April the 6th, it's going to rain buckets here in Shiloh. So a very uncomfortable night of sleep for Grant after a long, hard day of fighting, and I'm sure a big headache that night. So I thought this would be pretty cool to share. A uh, cannon barrel here turned upright with a ball on top, uh, commemorating the National Cemetery, Pittsburgh Landing, 1866. It has 8,590 interments, 1,220 of which is unknown, or known rather, and the 2,861 are unknown. So there's some numbers for you guys. And uh, there's a lot of, lot of men buried here, most of which did die here in Shiloh. All right, so um, I'm gonna get out of here because I do have to go back to my truck anyway to grab another battery because all of a sudden this one went from 45 to 2%. Don't know why, in a matter of literally two minutes. So we're going to go do that and we're going to get started exploring the battlefield here and more in depth and talk about the events leading up to Shallow and how this battle takes form. So it's Sunday morning, April the 6th, 1862. Now, the Confederates have been ordered to move out of Cornerth, Mississippi and they were to make a surprise attack on the Federal Army here at Pittsburgh Landing before they had time for reinforcements. Now, it's going to work in favor in that the Confederates get here on the night of April the 5th. They were supposed to be here a day or two earlier, but torrential rains and downpours from Corneth to here plagued the march and the roads became muddy, swampy, and just an outright nightmare to traverse. Saturday, April the 5th, they arrive close to this position at Fraley Field. At 4.55 a.m., you're gonna have a guy by the name of Peabody. He's going to order his men in a patrol to come out and scout for Confederate positions. You gotta think that the Confederates are wanting the surprise, the element of the surprise here. 
Well, because of those torrential downpours, some Confederates got the bright idea of discharging their muskets to see if they still work. And Beauregard, fearing that they had given away positions, said that uh, maybe I should call it off. Well, Johnston said, we'll meet them there. Come hell or high water, basically we're fighting uh, and we're repelling the Union Army before they get reinforcements. Well, Peabody has been ordered not to engage the enemy if he comes into contact. They don't want a battle breaking out before they can get reinforcements. Well, Peabody kind of goes against this at 4.55 a.m. and he sends men along the path I'm walking now. And they are going to come to this field called Fraley Field where they are going to encounter some Confederate pickets. They're going to exchange fire with them. They're going to turn into the woods where 300 more Confederates are going to come out and fire at them. Then they're going to turn into the woods once again, and then an oppressive around 3,000 Confederates are going to come out. And well, at that point, Peabody's men have just bought on the uh, Battle of Shiloh. And well, the rest is history. And this is where the Battle of Shiloh is going to kick off with Peabody's men on April the 6th at 4.55 a.m. Let's go see it. So where we're walking right now is once where Peabody's men are going to be. This is going to be Peabody's brigade of the Army of Tennessee, his first brigade, Prentice's 6th Division, companies B, E, and H. And they were engaged here from 4 55 a.m. until around 6 a.m. on April the 6th and then they fell back to the northwest corner of Safe Field. Now just in front of us if you could imagine where that marker is out there is where those confederate pickets are going to be. Then 300 confederates are going to fire and then 3,000 are going to come out and they're going to go uh-oh we need to get out of here. Now, Fraley is going to be, I mean, uh, excuse me, Peabody is going to be encountered by his commanding officer once they make the retreat back to camp. He's going to say, I'm going to have you for this. And Fraley's going to say, well, I did it. I'm going to answer for it, basically. But if it wasn't for Fraley, well, they wouldn't have had any warning that the Confederates were in the area. Sherman wasn't expecting an attack that size. And well, if an attack at all. What Fraley does is actually help prepare the Union Army as they are in camp and they begin to form battle lines because they know now the Confederates are coming. So you have Powell who has been ordered out here by Peabody and this is where he's going to start exchanging shots. Now, they're going to be able to hold them back for about an hour. But over the next 34 hours, 24,000 men will be killed, wounded, or captured here at the Battle of Shiloh. And Albert Sidney Johnson will be dead. All right, so now that we have seen where this battle kicks off, we're going to go explore the battlefield a little bit. Now, however, I am using the National Park Service tour uh, mount some for this episode i'm also using the american battlefield trust out some for this episode because of time constraints i i can't see everything but i just want to give you the major parts of this field the major parts of the engagement and maybe get you to be able to have a look for yourself if you can't come here to shiloh i want to be able to share it with you so you can actually visit through my visit so let's go as we continue this trek of history across america I gotta say, it's pretty cool to walk in this place. I've wanted to do this for a long time. And you can see how densely wooded Shiloh is. At the time of the battle, it was 90% wooded. There were fields and farms scattered here and there, just like Fraley Field right here. But for the most part, this was 90% woods, which is kind of crazy to think about. So I will tell you the National Park Service tour of this battlefield is kind of backwards. Um, it's all over the place because this is a two day battle intermingled 
all in the same locations pretty much for the for the majority so it uh it could be a nightmare if you're wanting to follow this battle chronologically and we're going to attempt to do it somewhat in this episode so just bear with me because it is a chore so if we don't get blown away here by the wind this is probably the second place i wanted to see more here in shiloh than anywhere else and this is the campsites of peabody's men now we were just at fraley field and we was talking about peabody is going to encounter the confederates they're going to retreat back to their camp which is going to be right here so let's explore this spot and talk about what happens and why there's a huge monument back here to peabody so this is your, is the campsite where peabody's men up under Prentice is going to be camped on April the 6th and April the 5th. Well, after Peabody's men encounters the Confederates, they retreat in the skedaddle back to their camp area right here where the 25th Missouri Infantry is camped. Now, Peabody's going to make his way here and Prentice is going to ride up as the Confederates are closing in on them from the direction in front of me here and he's going to say peabody i'm going to hold you post, par, uh, personally responsible for this and peabody will say basically i have no you know no <laughs> reaction of this i mean I, i'm responsible for my actions peabody's then going to take a musket ball to the face and he's going to be instantly killed so he's already wounded a number of times before this but he's going to get that last wound uh, to the head and end up dying right in this area so this is the first position in line of battle on april 6 1862 for three companies a one mile southwest an attack upon confederate pickets and others are going to be over at ray field but peabody isn't going to be with them because he's going to die somewhere in this general vicinity and if we walk over here this huge monument is the mortuary monument to Colonel Peabody. And this is where his men would last see him utter his last words. And uh, pretty, pretty sobering to know you're standing in the spot of someone you've read about where they have, you know, died. And this is where they took their last breath as he was hit in the head, just up under the lip, I believe. Wow. All right, so we're going to continue to press forward with this. And uh, after we have paid our respects to Colonel Everett Peabody and, yeah, his last fight. So the, the Confederates, what's going to end up happening with this fight in the camp, you may ask, is that well, the Union are going to be pushed out of this position. The Confederates are going to ransack their camps here. Uh, they're going to take whatever food they can find. They've got vests, they've got shoes. There's all kinds of stuff left behind here. And this is also going to be a position the Confederates are going to fall back to on the evening of August the, or April the 6th. And they're going to camp here for the night. But uh, yeah, they're... They get well fed here and uh, get ready to push into a day of hell or two days of hell. So as we're leaving this spot, I want to remind you guys, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you are saying, well, you're not giving all the details. Well, that would make even a longer video than the, what this episode is going to be. It's probably going to be one of my longest episodes in a long time. So yeah, that's the reason why. It's just a nutshell to get you introduced the rest of the digging and research is up to you. American Battlefield Trust, Emergent Civil War, highly recommend them. Where we are right now is Shiloh Methodist Church, but that's not the original church from the war, as you can clearly see. The original church looked more like this that stood here on April the 6th and 7th, 1862. Now, this is not the original church that's here now. This is a recreation to give us a glimpse into, into what that church actually may, to what that church may have actually looked like. Um, 
So we're going to go in here and uh, take a look at this and talk a little bit about what happens here on both April the 6th and the 7th. So as you walk in here, well, it is a uh, really just a simple church. This is pretty much what it would have probably looked like at the time of the battle. There are no photographs of this church here in Shiloh during the battle, but there are some hand drawings. So this is uh, what this church would have maybe have looked like during the time of the battle when General William T. Sherman was here and also General Beauregard. So on the morning of April the 6th, 1862, William T. Sherman, General, was in this location around Shiloh Church. He was not expecting a Confederate um, attack and he actually told his militiamen, oh, tut, tut, you militiamen get scared so easy. Those were pretty much the words that he said. However, it did happen. And Sherman will hold off here for a while on April the 6th, but he would be, end up becoming flanked a little bit and he would pull his forces out of here. Now, April the 7th saw General Beauregard in this position. Now, Beauregard has lost his, his really, really left arm commander here, uh, Sidney Johnston, on the April the 6th engagement. So he's without him on day two, and his Confederates are beat down. They are tired. They are worn out. Many of them are not even in existence anymore. Uh, they are gone from this world. So he's got to do something. So what he ends up doing is from here he's going to make plans he's going to try to figure out what to do um, he's going to be in sherman's position from day one um, right here in this location and he's going to set forth on the battlefield himself he's going to put his own self at risk like johnston did to get his men rallied and unfortunately it's not going to turn out that way his men are very scared they've seen johnston's body going back to corinth on the back of a wagon and they're, they're trying to convince Beauregard, hey, we don't want you ending up like Johnston here. You need to calm down. And, well, unfortunately, it's not going to work out. The Confederates only get one, one reinforcement uh, from Corneth, while the Union troops on April the 7th wake up with almost two armies of reinforcements here. So, yeah, it's not going to work out for Beauregard's favor in this position on April the 7th. And also in his position is going to be a field hospital. So this is probably the most recognizable place on a Shiloh battlefield. It's where Shiloh gets his name from. But I guarantee you the name Shiloh, which means a place of peace, wasn't a place of peace on April the 6th and 7th. And that place of peace is forever going to be tainted in history by what happens here on this very very ground there's some heavy fighting on this piece of ground here as a matter of fact the cemetery you see behind me uh, which is the shiloh church cemetery family members are going to say that the pre-war graves of family members that was here before after the battle they're not going to even be able to tell where they are anymore the carnage is so bad here um so you can just stand here and imagine being in uh, the, the boots of William T. Sherman, who was wounded in a hand on August the 6th, and then August the 7th, being in the shoes of General Beauregard as he's here trying to figure out what to do. It's, uh, there's a lot of decisions that's made right here at this church, and a lot of fighting and a lot of death as well. Pretty uh, sobering place to be. So where we are right now is at the Mississippi Monument at Rayfield. This is the newest monument here 
on a battlefield that Shiloh commemorated on uh, 2015, actually. In 2015, this was commemorated here. And if you can see behind the monument here, this is Ray Field. And we are standing in the direction, if you were here on April the 6th, 1862, you will have the Mississippians running forward towards the camera here. And they will repeat this a number of times and they will lose over 300 men in less than an hour. Hardly any of the Mississippi troops that charged across this field to hit Sherman's camps behind us at Shiloh Church would walk out of here without a least a wound. And in the distance, there is a, a Confederate mass grave still here on Rayfield containing many of these Mississippians who become known as the Bloody Sixth. Now, Lieutenant William Thompson of Company H of the Sixth Mississippi said, this is my first experience of being shot at and I was scared as the next man. Everyone was moving forward, hollering at the top of their lungs. We just had to get at those Federals who were shooting at us. There was no time to help the wounded. Most of the men on the ground were close friends, neighbors, and kinfolk and this would be the first time that a lot of the men on both sides here would see the elephant or see combat so this was a new thing to a lot of these guys who didn't think that they would see anything to begin with but sounded you know this war sounded like fun well april the 6th didn't become fun, too much fun anymore this is probably my number one spot out of all the spots here that I've said is my number one spot in Shalu, this is most definitely one of my number one spots. This is the mortal wounding, uh, wounding site of Albert Sidney Johnston. And uh, this is where he is going to be mortally wounded on April the 6th, 1862. And we're going to, he wasn't wounded in this exact position where the monument is, but we're going to go down and take a look at the approximate area of where he's wounded and talk about it just for a brief second because this is going to be one of the most monumental actions here in shiloh so the monuments right here we're going to make our way a little down this path we're not going to go all the way down here but we're going to talk about albert Sidney johnston for a minute he is one of the most cherished generals in my opinion of the confederate army in april of 1862 he looks everything as a general should he's tall he's got a good looking beard he has got some gray in his hair he is a sam elliott looking character and my if i had to describe him as what i would think about him he's sam elliott the guy is just a a general of a man he is everything a general is expected to be well april the 6th he's seeing that his men need to be pressed a little bit. They need to get some ump behind their step and they need to be pushed to make a stand. So he's going to come to the front. He's going to be the general's, the gentleman general. He's going to come to the front and he is going to make that push. Now, Johnston early in his life was wounded in a duel. He, uh, during that duel, he fired his weapon up in the air instead of at the guy he was dueling with. And the guy, well, fired at him and wounded him. Now, it is said that because of that, that General Johnston may not have known right off the bat that he was hit when he was in this very ravine that I'm in now. He's in here trying to press his men forward, trying to give them some momentum to press on into the battle. And he is hit in the right leg, and that severs an artery. Johnston bleeds out and dies. And this is going to devastate the Confederate Army here in Shiloh. It's going to devastate Beauregard. Beauregard has just lost one of his best generals in this very ravine. And, well, there's nothing that can be done to replace him. And so... This becomes, in my personal opinion, is kind of what I label as the high point of the Union Army here in Shiloh. They take out 
General Johnston. Now, it has been debated after the battle, was Johnston actually wounded in this ravine by one of his own men because the wound was in the back of his right leg? It's possible. I mean, we just never, we, we never will know. But Johnston, uh, Johnston does succumb to his wound. He bleeds out with it being an artery wound, and he does not survive April the 6th. 1862, the men watch as his body is being taken on a carriage back to Corneth, Mississippi. And this ravine is the scene of Johnson's final moments as he's trying to push his men forward. It's quiet in this ravine now, but on April the 6th, this is where Johnson saw his last moments of his life. All right, so we're gonna get out of here and continue here on a battlefield. But uh, I'm gonna get a little personal with you guys for a minute. You know, I don't get, I, I, I tend to think I don't get too personal here on the channel, oh, you know, very often. But this is the reason why I like doing these videos. I'm not able sometimes to do it as good as, you know, what some other people may do, but it's okay. I want to give you my version of things and i want to share my experiences of going to these places for the first time with you and it also gives me documentation that i could go back and watch myself um i'm standing in a place right now that i've wanted to come since i was a kid and it's cool to be able to share that experience with you guys i do tend to push myself a little bit I don't give myself enough time to film these sometimes uh, like today I don't have a lot of time but uh you know this is a dream fulfilled right here I'm standing in Shiloh Tennessee for the first time and to be honest didn't know I was coming I just decided the other day as you can see by my post I made on YouTube uh, whenever this video airs I did make a post and I said, I'm going to Shiloh, and here I am. So, and I'm seeing where one of my favorite generals, you know, lost his life, a place I've read about. It's pretty cool to be here. So pretty cool to see this spot. Guys, I want to thank you for making this possible. I want to thank you for allowing me to film these videos and I want to thank you for watching. And if you want to support the channel, don't forget to, sus to subscribe. And check out the American Battlefield Trust Emergency Civil War and Project Past and the History Underground. Yeah, all big buddies of mine. Got to push them. Read out productions as well. Hey, buddy. All right, so where I am right now is probably the most visited place on the Shiloh Battlefield and one of legend. This is the and penetrable hornet's nest um, or as we know it now the hornet's nest on um, april the 6th and 7th 1862 it was just a thicket um, but today we call it the hornet's nest because of the referencing that some of the soldiers said that there were so many bullets flying around their heads it sounded like an angry swarm of hornets so and uh yeah that's the name given now, I will say this, and I'm not taking away from this place. Uh, I learned this from another historian um, that, and, and this is something I thought for years as well, and I was guilty of, is that this was where the worst fighting took place. Yes, the fighting here was really, really, really bad in the hornet's nest, but there, were, there was fighting that was worse than this in other parts of the battlefield. Just when the National Park Service was making this place, they didn't have all of what you see behind me now. They had basically boards nailed to trees and they had to have something for people to come see. So they called it the hornet's nest. And this was one of those places. Now the fighting here was really intense and it did sound like an angry swarm of hornets that's been referenced by many of the soldiers who fought in this area of both north and south let's take a look at the hornet's nest before we before we get too far in here look at this thing right here oh my gosh that thing is huge okay so with that being said 
Where you're looking at now is a thicket that we now know as the hornet's nest. On April the 6th, 1862, you're going to have Prentiss and his men in this position, as well as Wallace. They're scattered throughout these woods. Well, Beauregard has got Randall Gibson and a bunch of Louisianians here in this position, and he's telling them, we've got to get them out of those woods. We've got to drive them out. So that's what they attempt to do. Not once, not twice, not three times, but more than four times, they try to drive the Federals out of these woods that you see around me. And they're unable to do so until the Federals find out they're about to be flanked. Now, Beauregard's going to order a charge at noon, and these charges are going to take all day long. This is going to start at 10 o'clock that morning, go through that evening until Prentice is surrendered and Wallace is dead. And over 2,200 Federals are in Confederate captivity. But it's not before these woods are littered with Confederate dead. The Confederates can't make it 100 yards to the front of the Union lines. It is very intense fighting in this wood line. And one Confederate colonel said that there were a many of our comrades dead in the woods and shot down even before they could see the enemy. So this is the most visited portion of the Shiloh battlefield and you're seeing it firsthand. How cool is that? And these are the positions of where some of these Union troops are going to be. Now, these markers face towards the enemy. These are where the men were facing and this is the 21st Missouri. This is Peabody's Brigade, Princess's this is 6th Division, Army of Tennessee. A portion of this regiment reformed here at 9 a.m. April 6, 1862. And then around 10 a.m., they become engaged up under General Prentice. 60 of the number attached themselves to the 14th Iowa and fought with it during the day and were captured with it in the camp of the 20, uh, 32nd Illinois at 5.30. So they're going to be here from around 9 that morning. Fighting is really going to kick up around 10 a.m. It's really going to become heavy around noon, and they're going to be captured and then retire about 5.30 p.m. that evening as prisoners. And man, this is such a cool place to see. So you've got guns here, artillery batteries as well. This is much as battery, uh, the first Minnesota light artillery. Uh, this is also gonna be part of printed the sixth division. And this battery was on an action too, on a riverbank near the mouth of Deal Branch. So I don't think they were captured in this location with the rest of the men, but uh, pretty neat. Now there is, some kind of signature there. I think that's just battlefield graffiti. Not sure. Whoever did it has pretty handwriting, but uh, don't do that. Um, here's a monument to Iowa troops here. But yeah, could you just imagine the hell of lead that flew through these woods on August the 6th and 7th? Now, engagements will happen in the furthermost part of this again on um, April the 6th, and set, or April the 7th rather, and I keep saying August, I don't know why, just excuse that. Um, but April the 7th, more fighting will take place here, but the bulk of the fighting is gonna take place here on April the 6th with a big part of Prentice being captured and Wallace being killed. So like I said, we can't get into all the meat and potatoes of what's going on here just because of time uh, constraints. And I really just wanna dumb it down in a way you can understand it and hopefully I don't get anything wrong but uh or mess it up too bad but it is just so cool to see this place you know and and that's the thing there's always a place like this on every battlefield it seems every major one a bloody lane a hornet's nest a bloody pond you know there's always something but uh for shallow well this is it um they have a bloody lane bloody pond and hornet's nest hmm so where we are right now is Duncan Field, and we're standing on what was become known as the Bloody Lane. Now, every battlefield really has a Bloody Lane. Was this really a Bloody Lane? It was, and it wasn't. So we just know this today as the Bloody Lane. But originally, on April the 6th, 1862, this was the field of Joseph Duncan, who was one of the many farms that was in this area. 
Now here, stubborn Union resistance is going to hold off superior Confederate forces for hours. This is where Wallace and his men, W.H.L. Wallace, uh, or William Hervery, uh, uh, or General William Hervey Lamb Wallace, this is where he is going to fight. And Wallace is a um, veteran of the Mexican War. He served up under General Zachary Taylor, later President Taylor, and practiced law in Illinois prior to the war. This is where he's going to be on April the 6th, 1862. Uh, that morning, um, he is going to march out. They're going to form a line of battle right where we're standing in this exact position along this farm road. And they're going to be uh, going to be joined by remnants of General uh, Benjamin Prentice, who his division had retreated from their camps after the first Confederate attacks of the morning. And there are going to be roughly 6,200 soldiers forming the center of the Union line in this position with 3,000 in reserve. And behind them on a ridge uh, back in this direction is going to be a line of cannons from three Missouri batteries, Confederate batteries, including Smith's Mississippi and Herbert's Arkansas battery, were forced to retreat from the rifle cannons uh, from those Missouri batteries. Rifle cannons, deadly accurate. And they're going to be more superior than the Confederate smoothbore cannons that they have here. Lieutenant James Thoreau commanded two guns of the Arkansas battery on the other side of the field across from us. He said, I have fired but three or four rounds when a rifle battery replied to me most handsomely. And it was being a little more than I felt disposed to contend with. Uh, General Ruggles then ordered me to simply move. He wanted him to move. So he did. And by 5 p.m., Union soldiers who had been lying down for cover in the woods right behind us, they're going to... Uh, then experience a lot of artillery fire. They are going to be laying here getting just pounded by artillery guns. And Colonel James Parrott of the 7th Iowa actually said as he was laying in this thicket that you see before us, being all the time up under a galling fire of canister grape and shell, which did considerable execution in our ranks, killing several of my men and wounding others. The Union line is then going to hold here for about seven hours, but they were about to be surrounded. So General Wallace is going to try to lead his man from the trap, but he is going to be killed. So we're going to head down. We're going to see where that happens and where Wallace falls. So this is the position of Ruggles Battery on April the 6th, 1862, when the Hornet's Nest situation had kind of flowed out of there and it kind of fell apart. These cannon would be put in this place and they would de deliver a devastating artillery bar uh, barrage on the Union infantrymen that's going to be on the other side of Duncansville in a thicket. This would ultimately um, lead to a surrender of around 2,200 Union troops. So that's a lot of Confederate cannon. So in the thicket you see before me is going to be the surrender of these Union troops on April the 6th. And this is going to occur around 4 to 5.30 p.m. as you can see depicted here. And you've got General Braxton Bragg, Breckenridge, Hardy, and Polk who are basically going to come in and make Prentice's men surrender. And then you have... Tuttle and Herbert, um, Herbert, Hurl, but, <laughs> well, I can't talk. With 6,200 men, Tuttle has 2,900 men. Uh, Prentice has 2,300 men. So, yeah, about 2,200 men are going to surrender. We'll call it that. Um, but this thicket right in front of us is going to be uh, part of the battlefield location named the Hornet's Nest. So right now we're actually headed into the thicket just to give you a quick glimpse of what these Union forces uh, would have had to endure during that day of August, the, or of April the 6th rather. And I just want to kind of put you in their shoes. 
Um, it is eerily quiet out here. I will say that. So if you can imagine, man, for hours and hours, they're getting pounded in here. Artillery begins to rain hell upon them. And then they're encircled. And then somewhere in this approximate is that spot that I'm in now, they're going to get captured. And just put yourself in those shoes for a minute. And as you look around, you see what printed this man saw about 5.30 p.m. on April the 6th. It's eerily quiet here. Wow. Hard to imagine what these men endured. Really cool experience. As you walk through here, it is uh, very eerie. And yeah, it's just, that's, a, that's the only thing I can say about it. It's just eerie to stand right where these men stood. So pretty cool um, moment here in Charlotte, for sure. All right, so as you can see behind me, we're, uh, we're leaving the spot of Prentice's men here uh, where they were captured. And we are headed back onto the battlefield and we're going to explore more of Shiloh. So you also have the 58 Illinois who are here of Sweeney's 3rd Brigade. Um, this was with, with W.H.L. Wallace who's going to die. This regiment was surrounded here and 223 of his officers and men captured at 530 on April the 6th. We are uh, making our way through here and I'm shooting this, yes, outside of the vehicle because we're trying to get as much done as we can here on the battlefield. But this is a very prominent high ranking union officer that's going to die here on the evening of April the 6th, 1862, as the Confederates are encircling the Federals and making them surrender. This is W.H.L. Wallace. He's going to be mortally wounded somewhere in this position inside of this thicket. And he is going to live until April the 10th. Now, his wife was here in Shiloh. She had come and got here while he was in battle. She wanted to surprise him. And she sat by his side until he died on April the 10th. If that's not divine intervention i don't know what is rest easy mr wallace rest easy so where we are right now is in the position of the army of tennessee 14 illinois and 25th indiana uh, this was vh's second brigade herbert's fourth division and these regiments were in order as above they were engaged here at about 5 p.m on april the 6th 1862 at the close of the first day of the battle they retire to a position near the siege guns. If we look behind the marker, you have the headquarters marker here for v uh, James C. Vietch, um, who is commanding. So just in the middle of this path, in the middle of the woods, you have his headquarters marked here. Pretty cool. So a fun fact, as we leave Yetch's marker, uh, headquarters marker here, a lot of people want to know, well, what did the battlefield of Shiloh look at, uh, look like during the time of the battle? Well, to be honest, a lot like it does right now, wooded, as you can see around me. It was 90% wooded on the battlefield here at Shiloh. So it was swampy. It was muddy, it was thick, and it was just a mess to deal with. And at times it was very hard to see the enemy. So this is a pretty much a accurate representation of what it looked like here as we are here close to the anniversary date of the battle, which is just a week or two away. So this is pr primarily what it would have looked like on the day of the battle. So Vietch's position is just 
straight forward you could just make out the marker through the trees of his headquarters and right here is where the 18th illinois infantry of harris first brigade uh, mcclaredon's first division they're going to be here on april the 6th at 4 30 in the evening and they were engaged here in this position as they were supporting McAllister's battery and then a little ways down from now as we walk right here just down from them there is going to be McAllister's battery itself of uh, the first illinois light artillery mcclaredon's uh first division and they were engaged here with three guns and they repelled the last attack upon mcclaredon's lines on sunday afternoon april 6 1862. so and this is where those guns were actually facing these markers face the same as that way the guns would have as we walk back towards my truck here you have another marker here for the 7th Illinois Infantry of Sweeney's 3rd Brigade. And this regiment was engaged here at 4.30 as well on April the 6th in support of McAllister's battery. It then retired to siege guns. So McAllister's battery here was pretty well protected by his Illinois troops. So where we are right now is going to be the end of the day on April the 6th and 7th. And this is going to be primarily la uh, Grant's last place that he's going to be on april the 6th his army is going to kind of bivouac here for the night and it is going to be a torrential downpour many of the soldiers accounts talk about coming into this position where i am now with water up to their ankles and they're they're kicking bodies of the dead and the wounded as they're making their way here it's just an awful awful experience uh awful end to a awful day and on top of it it's raining again grant is going to have his headquarters back a little ways behind me where the cemetery is now so sherman is going to come up to grant right over there in that area of where you we just were and sherman's going to come up to grant and he's going to say well grant we've had the devil's own day haven't we and grant's going to reply yes lick them tomorrow so that is Grant's reply, you know, it's, it's raining, it's not a good night of sleep after a long day of fighting, and you can, just can't imagine the things that take place in these positions. But, however, even though the Confederate Army is now in the Union camps they captured earlier that day, and they're resting down for the night upon our orders from uh, Beauregard, and Albert Sidney Johnston is dead. I mean, it's been a long day on both sides here. But General Buell and General Lew Wallace have now come to the rescue for the Union Army. So the men in this position are kind of in good spirits. They've got reinforcements that's made it here. And they are going to occupy this area as the final line of the day. They've got thunderstorms in the area, but it's okay. Buell is here, and Lou Wallace has made it in these positions. Now, the boats that's at Pittsburgh Landing are going to start to be filled with the dead, dying, and wounded. And there's one uh, soldier from the 9th Indiana Infantry who um, is named Ambrose Bierce. He's going to say that foot by foot, we move through the dusky fields, we knew not whither. The night was now black dark. It had begun to rain. Still we moved. We were being put into position by somebody. Inch by inch we crept along, trudging on one another's hills by way of keeping together. Commands were passed along the line in whispers. Very often we struck the feet against the dead, more frequently against those who still had spirit enough to present a moan. The rain, which had for hours been a dull drizzle, now fell with a copiousness that stifled us. We moved in running water up to our ankles. So it is a it is a long hard road here to end a long hard day. Uh, if the day wasn't long enough, now you got thunderstorms or having to move through dead, dying, wounded, blood, guts, you name it, to come to this position to get some rest, just to wake up the next morning and have Grant issue a counterattack against the confederate army so the confederates are going to be 
back away from us in this direction right ahead of me. They're going to be occupying the Union camps they took the day before or that day of April the 6th. And they're going to, uh, some of them is, is, are going to go back as even far as the April the 5th counts. So all the ground they just fought the gain, they just give it right back. And is, things are no better on that side. Sidney Johnson's dead. He was a big, big model to the uh, soldiers. They're still in shock over it. Beauregard is trying to figure out what to do. They did not get the element of surprise they hoped. And now, to make matters worse, you got Wallace and Buell in the midst or Grant. So they know the next day is going to be the devil to pay. So let's take a look around here, and then we're going to continue to work our way around the battlefield here and see what we can find. So you've got the first day positions here by the 14th Illinois Infantry. And these are just kind of intermingled together with first and second day um, markers here. But then you have all kinds of markers here, all kinds of cannons, positions, denoting the positions of the men on the first and second day. You gotta think about, this is right at Pittsburgh Landing. So this is going to be kind of the center point of action here. But one of the monuments I do want to take a look at is right here for the Iowa. And this Iowa monument is erected by the state of Iowa in commemoration of the loyalty, patriotism, and bravery of her sons who on this battlefield of Shiloh on the 6th and 7th days of April fought to perpetuate the sacred union of the states. And you've got the awesome monument here to Iowa, one of the most beautiful monuments on the battlefield. We also have some monuments to the Indiana, the 17th Regiment of Infantry for Indiana. And then if you work our way down, you've got a marker to the 51st Indiana, and then another marker here to the 53rd or 58 rather Indiana. So right along the road here, you're going to have the 40th Illinois and 6th Iowa in this position on the uh, 438, uh, 430 p.m. On April the 6th, 1862, they bivouacked here Sunday night. So this is where they ended up setting up their camp. Now, Lou Wallace, when he comes in, is going to establish his headquarters right here in front of us. And Lou Wallace is a welcome sight to these Union troops on the night, on the night of April the 6th. So Wallace is going to be able to give the Union forces some energy drink going forward along with Buell serving as reinforcements on the day of April the 7th when they're going to make this counterattack. And this is where Wallace is going to establish his headquarters right here in this vicinity. And I really love how they do the headquarters monuments here. Uh, some battlefields have these as mortuary mon uh, monuments but here, this one is a headquarters monument with these stacked cannonballs. All right, so even for me, things get kind of confusing when you're visiting the battlefield here um, because you have two days of battle here encompassing the same areas. Uh, so there's a whole lot of action going on that's important in a lot of different spots more than once. And this is one of those spots here because You've got the things that's going to kick off that morning as the battle starts, and then you've got the end of the day, April the 6th, and then start of the morning on April the 7th. Well, one way that Shallow is able to help you out with that is by putting these up. So this explains the markers here. Um, Army of Tennessee is in the blue, Army of Mississippi is in the red, Army of the Ohio is in yellow. The large square tablets give historical information of strength, armies, movements, corps, and divisions. The square tablets or ornamental co uh, corners mark positions where troops were engaged on the first day, Sunday, April the 6th. 
oval tablets mark positions where troops were engaged on the second day, Monday, April the 7th. And then if you look here, the home plate looking things are camp tablets. So you have the bivouacs of April the 6th right here in front of me and it continues down. So this is uh, the dominant, you know, the saying, this is where they count on the nights of April the 6th. And then you also have the artillery positions here from April the 6th as well. So we have made our way back to Duncan Field for April the 7th actions here in Shiloh. And this is where Kentuckians are going to fight Kentuckians as Buell's Union forces start to encounter Breckenridge's Confederates. After fierce fighting, the Federals advance from here to Water Oaks Pond. Now, Buell's left and center divisions engaged, engaged Confederates defending this area of Duncan Farm on Monday morning. Now, Duncan Field, like other parts of this battlefield, was sea actions on April the 6th and the 7th, as we were here earlier in this episode. Now, General Lovell Russo's brigade arrived at Pittsburgh Landing at about 5 a.m. on August the 7th as part of General Buell's forces who were coming to help in the situation here. Now, the brigade would advance westward along the Cornish Road to this field, and they began engaging Confederates for several hours. And this brigade included three batteries, or battalions rather, of infantry from the U.S. regular army. And they deployed in the line of battle, making a splendid impression on a nearby soldier who said they formed as though they were on parade. Now, Russo's brigade, along with General Jeremiah T. Boyle's brigade, and uh, who was from General Crichton's uh, division, attacking through previous days, Hornet and sector on their left faced General Breckenridge's Reserve Corps, the only Confederate Corps who was really still intact after the conclusion of the battle the Southern Army experienced on the first day. Now, immediately behind Russo and direct support was Colonel Edward Kurtz's brigade and Matt Cook's command. Now, late in the morning, having been shifted from their initial second day position on the left to the center of the field here, along the western edge of Duckett Field, the Confederate Orphan Brigade made a fierce attack on Russo's men. For a while, Kentucky Union soldiers were fighting against those Confederate Kentuckians. Now, the right flank of Russo's force engaged here was briefly threatened as a result until a portion of Grant's army, who was composed of remnants of General Stephen Herbert's division, moved up in the heavy woods north of the field and supported my cook's advance. The combat was intense as the battalion of 15th U.S. Infantry changed three successive times on, on the Confederates. The last time, they charged with bayonets. At some point in the fighting, the Confederate governor of Kentucky, George Johnson, who had joined the ranks as a private, was killed when he fell from his horse, mortally wounded. He was left on the field and he was captured by Union forces, dying a couple of days later on board one of the Union steamboats that are, is back at the landing. In the final hour of the morning, the Confederate left was driven back to Shiloh Church by the Union right, and that is where Grant's army was engaged and the retirement coupled the arrival of more Union reinforcements and the Southern withdrawal from the field here at Duncan Farm. So that is uh, in a nutshell with some help from the American Battlefield Trust, what happens here because this is an intertangled mess or can be, and it can be very confusing. It was to me, uh, but yeah, this is uh, Duncan Field, the site of a lot of fierce fighting on both days. Let's continue on. Okay, so we were talking about mass graves on the battlefield a little bit earlier in this um, episode. Well, this is a up close and personal look at one of these Confederate burial trenches here right behind me. Let's take a look at it and talk about it for just a brief second before we continue on. So this has two to the Confederate, uh, two to the Confederate dead in the trenches erected by the Tennessee Division, UDC 1935. Burial place, Confederate soldiers, um, Shiloh, 1862. Now, it is said that this burial trench contains the remains of 1,700 Confederates. I'm not sure that there are that many here, 
but there's a lot. Um, so this is one of the mass burial trenches. Now, as far as I know, the remains are still here and they have been undisturbed. <coughs> so you saw where the Federals are buried in the beginning of this, uh, this episode. Well, this is where the Confederates are, a lot of them are buried. Uh, the ones who were buried here on the battlefield itself. And this is where they remain. And this is one of five, I believe, that's known on the battlefield. I'm sure there are a lot more, um, but I think this is one of five. So again, uh, one of my favorite things to study um, is the aftermath of battles and the civilian um, relationship of what's going on and how it affected the cities, communities, and towns. I don't know, that's just one of my, one of the things I've become kind of infatuated with. And when I, see something like this it's, it's really neat for my mind to go back and think about what it was like when after the battle the federals are having to pick these guys up and bury them i mean it's uh really humbling to think about because it just brings the reality of war and how it affected not only the soldiers but the communities the towns it, it affected everything and uh yeah, pretty neat to stand here, but also really sad at the same time. Let's get out of here and continue. All right, so where we are right now is a very historic spot here in the battlefield of Shiloh. This is Water Oaks Pine. This pine was here during the Battle of Shiloh, and this is where Beauregard on April the 7th, 1862, is kind of going to lose the battle this is where he fails to kick back grant's counteroffensive, and he decides from this area to move back to corneth and so that's what the confederate army ends up doing and this pond was here at the time of the battle and i'm sure that uh this water was probably a maybe a different color at the time um, because I, I can imagine the scenes of what happened here. But if you look around, you have several monuments here. We, we didn't hit other aspects of the battlefield. Um, you know, we, we're pressed for time today, but I wanted to hit the main aspects of the battlefield. And this is one that I most definitely wanted to hit because this is going to culminate in Beauregard, you know, having to give up Shiloh and Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, this battle was called the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing for the Union and referred to as the Battle of Shiloh for the Confederacy for years until Shiloh just became the overall known name. Now, this is probably one of my favorite monuments on this entire battlefield here at Shiloh. And this is the monument to the Tennesseans who fought here during this battle. And the fight was for their homes and firesides, and that was said by Brigade General Patrick Claiborne, who had one of his 23rd Tennessee Infantry recount um, his experiences as well. But yeah, check it out. So Beauregard is going to be in this area and he's going to fail to hold back Grant. And that's going to end as a result of the battle here being lost for the Confederate Army. What started as a hopefully surprise attack to beat the Union Army back before they gained reinforcements from Buell turned around on this nose for him. Um, it wasn't anything that they did necessarily. It was just, well, it was a matter of luck, in my opinion. You had, you know, the colonel on the first day who goes out the Fraser Field and just happens to come by them. And things just don't work out for either one of the armies. This is early in the war. Many of the soldiers here are new. They're seeing the elephant or their first battle, uh, which is the meaning of that. For the, they're seeing the first battle for the first time. So this battle becomes a little disorienting 
um, men are where they're not supposed to be or other men are where they're supposed to be and then others aren't and I mean it's just a melee of confusion and when you're studying this battle it kind of plays into it a little bit and I can I can say that from personal experience like the actions here at Jones Field I don't quite understand it's just the aspect of this of this battle I I just haven't totally grasped yet and that's okay um but it's neat to think about this place here I don't know why bloody pond here on the battlefield which we we didn't see um but there is a bloody pond here on the battlefield i don't know why it's referred to as bloody pond because there's no mention that even correlates that that pine was even there however this one was and this was here during the battle and this is where beauregard is going to make his last stand and fail and he would withdraws back to corneth and then corneth is another battle all in itself which hopefully we'll get to in a later video on this channel so we can't do it today but we're going to make another trip back do corneth and do the aftermath of what happens here so as with it, any part of the battlefield i do have an interpretive plaque here and this is basically explaining what i just said um the second day beauregard personally led his troops here he was trying to motivate them himself you know, leading counterattacks against Sergeant Union forces. Uh, they charged through this area and this field right here to our right. And after about two hours of seesaw fighting here, he realized that his troops were exhausted. They were finished and they had an orderly withdrawal. I mean, Beauregard didn't get fresh reinforcements. Grant did. They didn't make it here in time. They didn't get the element of surprise. And so they made their camp and the battle was over the union here made their camp among their dead the battle's over Beauregard starts withdrawing and it's it's just absolutely a horrific scene in this area you know we were talking about at one of the mass confederate burials about the aftermath of battle well one of the aftermaths is the establishment of field hospitals this is 1862 this is early in the war and medicine is really starting to evolve with the field hospitals. Now, there are, much like today, steps to be taken for a soldier that's wounded on the battlefield. Before he is sent to a hospital, he's got to get enough care to be able to be transported safely to that hospital. Well, right behind me is where one of the first tent hospitals here in Shiloh was set up. And this is going to be the spot where a lot of these men are taken off of the front lines of battle. They're going to see the grisly scenes of arms, legs, hands, fingers, whatever, amputated. And this is going to be the scene of one of those field hospitals. So it's, it's pretty cool when you're able to visit places like Gettysburg, like we have, and Antietam, and see the places where these hospitals were. But to stand at Shiloh on the site of one of the tent hospitals here before these men were later loaded onto steamboats, wagons, or um, sent elsewhere, to stand in is that spot of where they come in and receive the care off the battlefield. You can't help but imagine the scenes here of devastation where I'm standing behind me. So just uh, take a minute and think about it. It's quiet now, but I guarantee you, April 6th and 7th, this wasn't so quiet. That is the Battle of Shiloh in a nutshell. And of course, we're going to end this episode of History Saver where Beauregard's troops are going to push back to. After the events that transpire at the pine over on the battlefield at Shiloh, well, his troops fall back to this very position. And then, after all of this is said and done, Corneth is next on the chopping block. So with that being said, guys, can't wait to see you from the next place. We will come back and talk about the battle and seizure of Corneth at some point later in the future on this channel. But for now, we're going to end the Battle of Shiloh where it needs to be ended. And that's back right here where we started at Corneth. Next on the list for us, however, 
is Virginia and Maryland and Washington DC so be it uh, you're in store for another treat here of a lot more battlefields that I can't wait to bring you along with me to see and uh yeah very cool to see this place right here until next time keep observing history stay safe we'll see you from the next adventure okay.